Okay, welcome back today. We'll look at Standage's book, A History of the World in Six Glasses, and it's going to be part three, which will deal with spirits. And so far, we've looked at both um, beer and then wine, and now spirits. We've got a few more drinks to go, and let's flip down to well, before we do that let's take a look again at our timeline here so there you have beer wine and the third drink spirits so when does this drink really start to kick in and make an impact on history it's definitely during the age of exploration so just want you to think real quickly here you may not know anything about world history but I bet you know this when do you think worldwide age of exploration really began for humans. What was the big event that changed that? Any ideas? Maybe you remember a date that has something to do with sailing the ocean blue. Ah, there you go. Once Europeans made contact with the New World, that's the really the beginning of worldwide trade and a, a major uh, breakthrough. And so we're talking about um, between 600 and 1450, there are advance advancements made towards um, being able to do this, to explore the world. And spirits really run into the next uh, period, period four, global interactions. Because between 1450 and, say, 1600, that most of what we're going to talk about here is going to happen. And then into uh, the, in, uh, the revolution in America. So... That's in the 1770s. There is some overlap with these drinks, certainly. Um, the development of spirits happens earlier, and then the impact on history, I think some of the impacts are much later in, in time period. So as we march through here, I, I really have to emphasize to you that thinking about the periods in which these drinks uh, um, make a major impact on world history is really a key to getting your mind around the whole scope of the course, which is what we're trying to do here. So part three is spirits in the colonial period. You see the sign there, 1716 in Concord, the colonial inn. Um, below it is a distillery, and we'll show you the process of how that worked, but you see the heat um, here in the oven. You've got uh, some concoction here being heated, and then very simply, uh, being dropped in there and then some uh, liquid also being dropped in and then you turn this to to get that liquid out of there rum is going to play a big role here of course the Atlantic revolutions which we we'll, um, really study in the spring are going to be impacted by the all of this but another uh, note here slavery uh, massively important to this time period and uh, has an impact on so many people's lives. Breaking down sugar cane and creating sugar uh, and molasses and those types of things that end up in these drinks, that kind of demand for that product um, leads Europeans to use slaves at a, at a massive number. And uh, So what are spirits anyway? I mean, why do they even call them spirits? Seems kind of spooky, doesn't it? It is not what you might think when you're first uh, considering Standage and if you've read ahead here and you've seen uh, the Coca-Cola chapter well you know for certain that we're gonna talk about the Christmas spirit and uh, our good old friend Santa Claus here but that's not quite where we're at yet it's not the spirit of Christmas yet and this is what it looks like to distill uh, wine in this case where you could distill any alcoholic beverage with the burner here and you heat it the evaporation that happens is going to go and end up coming through this tube the, con uh, the condenser and the drips that are going to happen into here the evaporation is I think where they get the name spirits from um, it seems like a spirit world thing for uh, the evaporation to happen and so that's where I guess they get this from. Of course, the lesson here, what you understand, is that alcohol is going to boil at a different temperature than water does. And so when this process comes through 
the distillery and it comes out the other end, it's going to be much more highly concentrated in terms of alcohol. But that doesn't seem all that spooky, does it? And not that much fun. It's not a big deal. Let's have a little bit more fun here and talk about some spooky things. So why do they call them spirits? It's certainly not for this spirit right here. This is the Wem ghost from the Wem Town Hall in Shropshire, England, which incidentally we'll learn about in the Industrial Revolution uh, coming up in, in the spring. Uh, in 1995, fire um, completely destroyed the, the Wem Town Hall. And a man named, named Tony O'Reilly um, showed up with his camera. This is 1995, so he had a decent, you know, 35 millimeter type camera. And he took a picture of the of the outside of the building and inside the building it seems to be a girl looking out at everybody like oh I started this fire <clears throat> well locals believed it to be an old legend that this girl was Jane Chum who was accused of setting a fire in 1677 at the same town in Shropshire England um, so it's real interesting and spooky, but like a legend in history, local history played a big role into people believing this was true. And nearly every expert that came around um, in the 1990s to look at this thing couldn't figure out that um, it was anything but a real true image. I mean, could that be the end of a burning um, log here? And so it looks like someone's face, but it's really not. Could this just be a stick kind of protruding out there, although it looks like it could be, you know, her arm or something? Definitely looks like it could be a little girl. Early accounts believed that the photo was not fake. Yet five years after the photographer died in 2010, uh, a person in the town, a 77-year-old man, came across an old postcard uh, from 1922 and he realized that the girl in the image matched the girl from the postcard and that led investigators to look at it and say okay it was somehow doctored and probably um, this was an image taken off of a with with a television set added into it so kind of interesting a little bit spooky uh, but this is not the kind of spirits we're talking about is it this kind of spirit and some of you are going that's a guy from Scream. Well, this is a, a truly terrifying picture, and most people can't quite explain it. It's probably a photographic an anomaly, anomaly. Um, but this happened, I think, also in Europe, and uh, this is the actual uh, picture that people thought might be a ghost. But what they did was it that mask-looking thing there inspired the the Scream movies. So it's probably an anomaly but hard to tell and they haven't been able to tell how this one is doctored it sure has scared a lot of people over the over the time that it's been around another one is a uh, pretty famous image and maybe the most famous image of a ghost um, this also happened in the UK it's called the brown lady uh, from Raynham Hall in Norfolk Norfolk uh, England and that's this is 1937 so it looks like the image of a woman descending down the stairs and the same image kind of matches this story of a woman who was trapped there who was having an affair with someone else and was kind of trapped there. So it's known as the brown lady because of the type of dress she was wearing. But critics claim that the photograph um, easily could be doctored by grease on the negative or potentially another double exposure uh, they captured somebody walking down the stairs and then snapped another picture but it like kept the same frame according to the two guys who were there they were certain this was a real uh, specter coming down the stairs and they stopped and uh, the main guy who was walking through there for the publication the journalist uh, had his photographer snap this image and it was in this uh, magazine called Country Life, and so, but most people today think it's probably not a real spirit. So let's talk about real spirits. High spirits, high seas, and a gift from the Arab Arabs is what um, Standage calls it, and it is Arabs. So make sure you pronounce that correctly. Uh, it is sort of offensive to say it in the other way, Arabs. That's 
not going to fly in my classroom, so it's Arabs. Uh, make sure we get that pronoun pronunciation down, and most people just don't know, So, but we'll be working on that one. One can distill wine using a water bath, and it comes out like rose water in color. This is from an Arab scientist and philosopher who wrote it in this book. This is from 800 and one to, uh, to 873 CE, the book of chemistry and perfume and dis distillations. So they're working on creating um, better smelling like perfumes and colognes. The process of distillation originates in Cordoba by the Arabs and allows this miracle of medicine, uh, this distil distilled wine to travel better because you know they're already using beer and wine for medical purposes and there are some potential reasons you would use alcohol um, medically especially back then when there were less drugs available to help people and less medical technology but distilling wine as we just discussed earlier makes it much much stronger and so when you continue to distill it it makes it stronger and stronger still this ancient knowledge of wisdom from the Arabs though is a good example of after the fall of the Roman Empire, the Western world in Western Europe uh, kind of falls into some chaos. It's the Middle Ages is what they call it, but it's more of a time period where um, there's not as much civilization happening. It's, people move more to the countryside and, and to rural areas. And we'll talk about the feudal system and how that developed and everything as we go here. But... The really important thing world history wise is to realize the connection here between the knowledge that happened and the knowledge and wisdom and learning and philosophy, the scientific breakthroughs that happened during the classical era, sort of get dispersed then into the Arab world and then they come back during the time period of the Renaissance and rebirth in Europe. So another way of looking at this is to consider our picture again of the distilling flask and vapors you've got the thermometer on there to measure the temperature so this is correct the burner underneath heating it up and then you've got the condenser that's going to slide across into the receiving flask to get the distillate but there's maybe an analogy here I want to make with uh, the time period that we're talking about when this knowledge shifts from the European world to the Arab world and then it later shifts back after the age of exploration and the Renaissance occurs. So one way of looking at it would be like this. Uh, the burning underneath the heat that's created on Europe is the Gothics, the Vandals and the Huns, oh my, or the Magyars, the Muslims and the Vikings, oh my. These are two uh, different time periods or two different groups of people who put pressure on Europe uh, the European power at the time, which was the Roman Empire, and later uh, the Western European Empire for sure seems to, to dissipate. When it does, some of that learning shifts east to the Byzantine Empire. And this is one of the harder parts of the year, I think, for students. This is chapter um, you know, 9 and 10, where we're talking about um, Europe in the Middle Ages or the transition to it. So SPQR, the Senate and the people of Rome, which we'll discuss a lot in class, is the Roman Empire. If they're in the original flask there, a, a power, they're going to have heat put on it and they're going to change and that's what's going to happen. But the learning and of the Greek and Roman philosophers and educators, so Socrates and Plato of that time and later the, the Senate and the people of Rome, this idea of what Rome is, and the military technology and concrete and building and all the, the science that happened during that time period as well, is sort of being evaporated because of the heat put on it by these invaders. It moves then to the Byzantine Empire, and you can kind of see it here by the graphic I, I created, where you've got Rome is being broken into parts there. And um, there are strong points of the Byzantine Empire, which some just argue is Eastern Roman Empire, but the Arab Caliphate, which later becomes, we'll learn about in the spring, the uh, Ottoman Empire, this is where uh, the learning spreads to, this area in green. Um, so Muslim scholars and Arab scholars are taking this wisdom and knowledge. It's just basically passed along, just like trade. You trade things and you come across libraries and information and, and learning. And the Greeks of the Byzantine Empire, there was some crossover there between the old Greek world and the Byzantine world. 
and then that of course flowed into the Arab uh, Caliphate as well. So what you have then in essence is this tremendous new advancement and maybe a more powerful a set of understanding and knowledge and wisdom this tremendous new uh, accomplishments that occur in science and astronomy and math real breakthroughs in the Islamic world that happened during the Middle Ages of course this sort of gets passed back to Europe later we'll talk about that as we go here but um, the knowledge that spreads throughout Europe after this time period mostly happens because of the new internet of the 17th century Gutenberg's invention called the printing press and you can see here up to a million books printed in the 18th century that's a massive accomplishment compared to just a few hundred uh, during the 15th century without this printing press to help what kind of knowledge spreads well just about everything spreads including the uh, the age where the Catholic Church is questioned and we'll, we'll talk about Lutheranism as we go throughout the year as well but with an alcoholic purpose behind it and with the spirits that we're, we're concentrating on here this distillation process it spread through the use of uh, the printing press and local and small communities end up taking that information creating their own mix and match of an alcoholic uh, brew that becomes known for that area or that town or that place and it's the printing press that helps that occur hard liquor particularly brandy and rum placated soldiers on these long uh, trips as they were uh, exploring the world during the age of exploration this is the 15th 16th 17th centuries which another way of thinking of the 15th century is it's the 1400s or the 16th century is the 1500s the 17th century is the 1600s I know it sounds confusing but it's just that's the way it is that's the way the terms are so grog is really responsible for these European powers like Great Britain to become a very strong power um, in terms of on the seas with their navy and what is grog it's rum and water and lemon or lime juice and the key there being the lemon or lime juice what Standage says this improved the taste but it also reduced illness and this thing called scurvy fleet physicians thought that this doubles the efficiency of the fleet so if you look at a group of sailors and naval uh, personnel from Great Britain and you compare them to France it's no wonder that Great Britain won out in some of these um, wars during this time period because their fleet was much more successful and who ordered the fleet to um, be given grog none other than Admiral Edward Vernon and um, he was known as the old grog because this is the type of jacket that he wore as you see there in the picture um, in 1747 this is 10 years later uh, James Lynn formally recognizes and understands that it's the lemon or lime juice that is creating this nutritional balance that helps to prevent scurvy then they really know why that was helping them initially Mount Vernon too. this interesting side note here the estate of George Washington one of the most famous places in America most famous homes in America was named after this old grog Edward Vernon because of uh, Washington's brother having served with him and um, kind of shows you the link there of uh, the American colonists back to Great Britain um, you wouldn't think that you know the founder of our country and our first president would name his estate after uh, someone from the old country and from England but you know it's a family estate I guess so in the colonies um, limited alcoholic beverage choices creates a need for this and it develops and the distilleries and distilling process they're going to use what they can to make alcohol in a cheaper way rum becomes hugely important so you've got the molasses act the sugar act and the boycotts of imports and they're all fights over taxes with a North American colonists the American colonists and back with uh, King George the third of England this brings about the Declaration of Independence in 1776 the Dear John letter that the colonists send back to England to say hey it's been nice and everything I've enjoyed you know seeing you but maybe it's time for us to see other people um, and maybe it's time for me to have my independence from you 
uh, Stanage argues that rum is probably much more responsible for this breakup than uh, tea, which most people assume was the reason, the Boston Tea Party, which was, you know, historically made legend and probably overblown in, in um, proportion. The no taxation without representation is an important thing, and it was a founding uh, principle of our country that you should have representation, and we weren't represented uh, well with the English government. However, to say that taxes was a big deal is a bit of a stretch because the Europeans themselves, the English uh, uh, citizens, paid way more in taxes percentage-wise than the Americans did. So there's a little bit of truth uh, to it, but it's not perfect truth for sure, and you have to kind of be careful with history, um, which you learn American history for sure. It's only 200 years. But only near the end of the protest did they refer much to tea anyway. The really powerful part of this chapter and the thing to remember and be thinking about is how this leads to social inequality and the oppression of native people and of slaves brought from Africa mostly to work on these uh, sugar plantations. It is tremendously difficult work. You've got people that have to um, you know, work with the sugar cane and cut that down. It's really, really difficult to do that. Then you have to burn it to create the, the sugar or molasses. This is very, very difficult. And, uh, you know, slaves didn't last long in this process. They were burned up right along with um, the sugar cane and burned out. And it's it's a pretty terrible time period in, in um, American history for certain. But the spirits were involved with the spread of knowledge and exploration, the use of Arab technology, the spread of disease, slavery, trade relationships, revolution, and of course the subjugation of indigenous peoples. That means the uh, oppression of people who were originally from the Americas. So to me, that's a, a pretty big deal. The Whiskey Rebellion also played as played up in a, as a big part for Standage. It's more of an American history thing, I think, for the Whiskey Rebellion, but you get the, the spirit of it or understanding of it. What you have during this time period of the Age of Exploration is a massive change in world history. This is a, change, a, a changing um, face of the globe in a way that's never happened before with human intervention. All the products you see here on the top arrow are coming from North America and moving to Europe. All the products at the bottom moving from Europe and Asia to the New World. Things that had never been seen in the Americas before, like coffee beans, pear and peaches, olives, citrus fruits, uh, bananas, sugar cane, honeybee. And the really important stuff are the last ones on the group I'm going to mention. Grains, which help support a really large population. Obviously, Europe, much more populated than in the Americas. Um, along with that, domesticated animals like cattle, sheep, pigs, and horses, they didn't have any of those in the Americas. The only thing that they had in the Americas was that was domesticated as an animal. It means domesticated that man could use to farm or uh, use for transportation and to carry things. Um, the only domesticated animal in the Americas was in South America in what we call Peru today with the llama. That was it. Um, and the last one on my list here is disease, which absolutely devastated the human population of the Americas. The numbers are really, really hard to be exact about and to, and to put it on an exact number, but one of the ones that always strikes me and makes me think is the Mexican, what we think of Mexico today, but natives of indigenous people of Mexico, there were about 25 million people who lived in that area. And this is an estimate because we didn't have like census reports back then. But in 1492, Columbus lands, there's 25 million people living in Mexico. In just 30 years, it was down to 1 million. And whether that's, you know, guns, European guns, uh, germs, like you're seeing here, or steel, uh, the new technology that the Europeans had. It doesn't really matter. The people died in the end, and it, it is a time period of... It's uh, pretty important when you consider the implications. Now, 
implications for you today might be a little bit different. But if you think about these food groups, the American hot dog, you know, we think of it all American hot dog, but all of that meat would not have been made here in America originally. It all, it's all coming from the Colombian exchange to America. Italian spaghetti, which is a personal favorite of mine, you don't have the red sauce without uh, tomatoes from the New World. And Mexican fajitas, also a personal favorite of mine, there's no way you're going to have beef fajitas, number one. Rice, flour, forget about it. Well, that's, that's Italy. Sorry about that. But you get the idea here, the exchange of just uh, plants and uh, food groups is one thing. But weeds, um, the animals, uh, just the physical change in the way the, uh, the world was made up. Cutting down trees and logging and fishing, these are all things that made massive changes to the Americas. We'll learn about all this when we look at guns, germs, and steel at the beginning, especially this horizontal, and I'll show you down here with the mouse, this horizontal growing um, parallel latitude that the Europeans, the Asians, and Northern Africa have in common. You can have the same kind of crops and domesticated animals uh, thrive and flourish across that whole territory. North-South is really where the growing, um, the growing seasons or the growing, uh, the, the that's really where that the trade could happen between the Americas. You're going to move products north and south, and it's just much harder to do in the Americas. So one of the other reasons that culture just didn't thrive as much in the Americas. I don't, I don't mean by culture, but civilization, the mass numbers of people. Uh, you don't see that in the Americas as quickly as you did in, in Europe because of domesticated animals and systematic agriculture and the ability to support a larger population. So Guns, Germs, and Steel is the book. By Jared Diamond, we'll look at the video clips, the first part of that, in the very first part of our uh, look at Unit 1. Later on in the semester, we'll uh, talk quite a lot about Alfred Crosby's book, The Columbian Exchange, The Biological and Cultural Consequences of 1492. These are really both groundbreaking, uh, really important works that help us understand and explain the way the world works and the way the world changed. So the next group of videos we'll be working on here and getting done here before school will deal with coffee, tea, and Coca-Cola. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll see you next time, and we'll talk about the second half of Standage's book, 